Um, okay, so uh, let's just give a brief recap of um, the things that we discussed last time. Um, so uh, we were discussing heterotic compactifications from 10 down to four dimensions, and we wanted to preserve n equals one supersymmetry in four dimensions. So we took a Kaluza Klein ansatz, 10 dimensional space, Slinkowski space times x6, and uh, we looked at the 10 dimensional supersymmetry variations, and we tried to find a non-trivial solution that is, we wanted to find an unbroken supersymmetry transformation, um, which preserves four-dimensional Poincaré invariant. And we also set the fluxes, uh, 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 the flux of the B field to zero. And once we did that, uh, we were just left over with these two equations. Uh, we had a spinner, epsilon six plus, a positive chirality spinner on the internal manifold X6. And uh, we found that the spinner has to be covariantly constant. And so this is a condition both on, right, uh, a condition on the metric on X6. And um, we also found that uh, this contraction of the, uh, the field strength of the gauge field, FMN contracting with gamma MN acting on epsilon six plus has to vanish. Okay. Uh, then we went to a long discussion about the, the, the meaning of these constraints, the geometric conditions that they impose. Um, so the condition that you have a covariant constant spinner means that you have reduced Escher through holonomy or equivalently that X6 is a Calabrian manifold. It means it's a complex manifold. It has a Kähler form which is closed, therefore it's a Kähler manifold and it has a vanishing first churn class. And uh, there was a theorem of Yao which uh, tells us that um, for any such um, uh, Calabrian manifold there exists a unique Ritchie flat metric which is uh, uh, in, with a given Kähler class and a given complex structure. In particular, we're interested in the deformations of these structures. So the deformation of the metric then is, uh, by this uh, existence and uniqueness, is just given by deformation of the complex structure and deformation of the Kähler structure. And uh, then, so these are deformations of the metric. And then we discussed uh, Hodge numbers, um, HPQ, which were cohomology groups, complex analogs of the RAM cohomology groups. And uh, we saw, uh, well, very briefly at least, that um, the dimension of this complex structure model S space is counted by H21, and the dimension of the Kähler model S space is counted by H11 of X, and these were in fact the only independent degrees of freedom in the Hodge diamond, everything else was either zero or one or related by symmetry, okay? Uh, furthermore, we had a B field. The B field deformations, basically, uh, you have another H11 deformations of those, and they end up complexifying the Kähler model S space. Um, okay, then we moved on to uh, this set of equation, equation involving the field strength, and um, so that this is, uh, uh, this can be rewritten as the hermitian jan mills equations, saying that the zero two part of the curvature has to vanish, and the Kähler trace of the curvature has to vanish. And uh, then we discussed that, uh, again, much like for the situation for Calabria manifolds, where we don't know how to write down uh, uh, explicitly a Ritchie flat metric, so here too, we don't really know how to write down explicit solutions of these equations, but could, we could reformulate this problem as saying that uh, um, a hermitian mill solution corresponds to a holomorphic polystable bundle. Okay. So hermitian mill implies holomorphic polystable is the easy part, and then again, there was a difficult uh, uh, existence proof that tells you that holomorphic polystable applies that there exists a unique solution to hermitian mills. mills Okay. So that's uh, good so far, but now we sort of want to have an analog of the story we have over here. So we have now an existence and uniqueness, so we got up to here roughly, uh, existence and uniqueness of the Calabria metric. And, uh, and here we discuss deformations of these structures in our, our Kaluza Klein reduction, if you wish, the effective fields that you're left over with in the four dimensional effective theory. And so now we want the analog of that uh, for the gate sector. So we want to understand the deformations uh, uh, of, these, uh, of these bundles. They correspond, to, um, they correspond to the massless fields in the four-dimensional effective theory. And again, we have a similar problem uh, as we had uh, in this case. Uh, so we can't write down, uh, we, didn't, we couldn't write down the Ritchie flat metric. We can't write down the Hermitian and Mill solutions. So if we want to learn anything about the Kaluza Klein reduction uh, of the gate sector, um, it had better, we had better uh, invent something that doesn't uh, depend on the explicit solution to these equations because we can't write down the solution to these equations. And uh, indeed, so that leads us to uh, 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 Dolbeau cohomology. Okay, 
So um, remember that since the zero to two part of the curvature vanishes, um, okay, so, right? Um, the zero one part of the uh, of the connection uh, squares to zero, and uh, so on holomorphic bundles you can define an analog of the Dobo complex, which take values uh, in a holomorphic bundle. So we previously discussed Dobo homology just for PQ forms, and now we're going to discuss uh, Dobo homology for uh, zero comma P forms. Uh, which are valued in a holomorphic bundle. So in a holomorphic bundle, you have this operator, the, the, the zero one part of the connection, in, uh, because F02 is zero, this squares to zero, so this is a complex. And we can look at the cohomology, and we can look at the kernel of uh, this Dobo operator, and we can model out by the image of this Dobo <laughs> operator. And by the way, incidentally, so I've written a sub A here, and I forgot to uh, put it over here, but it doesn't really matter. As we saw, if, you, if you're in the situation where, you're, where you have a holomorphic bundle, by a complexified gauge transformation, you can actually set the zero one part of the uh, covariant derivative to zero. Okay, so um, this is a set of cohomology groups, bundle valued uh, uh, zero P forms uh, with some equivalence relations and some holomorphic relations. And um, uh, so the degree here in general uh, goes from, uh, so on the Calabria threefold, P could be zero, one, two, or three, okay? And uh, these cohomology groups have various interpretations, and in fact, they're exactly what you need to discuss the kaluza klein reduction of the gate sector and derive the low energy effective four-dimensional theory, okay? Um, so uh, the claim is as follows. Um, so uh, let's first look at the P equals zero. Uh, component of these uh, degree p equals zero, the Bow cohomology group. So V here is an EA times EA bundle or an SO32 bundle for the heterotic string. Again. Okay. And uh, so uh, claim is that uh, uh, the degree zero cohomology counts the unbroken gauge generators that survive in the four dimensional effective theory. Okay. So we had this huge uh, 10 dimensional gauge symmetry, which was either EA times E8 or SO32. And by compactifying it, you're spontaneously breaking most of that gate symmetry. Uh, but there's a few gate transformations that are unbroken that survive in the four-dimensional theory. And uh, it's, this, it's this gauge group, it, sorry, it's this uh, cohomology group that counts these generators. Okay? In fact, there's a nice uh, Lie algebra structure on, uh, on these things, and uh, that corresponds to actually the Lie algebra structure on the, uh, of the four-dimensional, effective four-dimensional gauge theory. Okay? Um, the other one we'll be interested in is the degree one uh, cohomology group. So it turns out that the degree one double cohomology um, describes the deformations um, of the holomorphic structure on the bundle, and the deformations of the holomorphic well deformations of the structure which preserve uh, uh, right uh, preserve some kind of hermitian mills condition, and um, uh, uh, so deformations in general uh, give you massless bosonic fields in the effective four-dimensional theory, and um, so this therefore discounts massless bosonic fields in the four-dimensional theory that you get from reduction from the gate sector, and of course with supersymmetry they will be paired up with uh, chiral fermions into chiral superfields. Okay, um, you may wonder. Uh, uh, so I'm not really going to discuss. You may wonder about the other degrees. So there's also a degree two cohomology, for example. Okay, that also has a significance. It doesn't really count matter or, or, or something like that in the four-dimensional theory. It turns out to count certain obstructions to these deformations. In other words, it's, it describes interactions. It describes superpotential terms. Um, okay, so uh, understanding why this is true is not really all that hard. Uh, I've written it up in the notes, but perhaps I don't want to spend too much time on it. So um, I'm just going to take this as given. Uh, it's really not all that hard to understand. I mean, these are the global holomorphic sections of the bundle, basically. So the claim is that the global holomorphic sections of this E8 and C8 or S32 bundle are the unbroken gate symmetries. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm just going to use this um, and uh, illustrate this with an example. But um, if you're at all interested in this, it's not hard to understand why these claims are true, and you, should, uh, you might want to check it in the notes. Okay. Okay, so um, I want to apply it just to uh, the, probably one of the most famous examples of uh, string compactification, semi-realistic string compactification, um, which is called the standard embedding. Um, so um, what do we do? So uh, we're going to consider the E8 times E8 heterotic string, okay? 
And uh, these two E8 factors, uh, at least uh, uh, at the leading order, they don't talk to each other, so I can just uh, focus on one E8, and I can do something similar for the second E8, but ignore it because it doesn't talk to the first E8. Um, okay, and uh, so now what we're gonna do, um, well, uh, we need a solution, remember that we need some kind of solution to the Hermitian Mills equations. And um, last time we sh uh, I gave you a canonical example of a solution to the Hermitian and Mills equations, namely you can just take the spin connection, uh, the, so the, the, the standard connection on, uh, on the uh, holomorphic tangent bundle of a Calabria threefold. Okay, that's a SU3 connection. And so that's a nice Hermitian and Mills connection, so why don't we try and use that one? Okay, so this is called the standard embedding means that you take your E8 connection to be the, your SU3, the, the spin connection, the SU3 connection that you get from the holomorphic tangent bundle of your Calabria threefold. Okay, so um, now uh, to understand uh, the low energy effective theory, um, I then want to, um, so we take this SU3 connection, so um, we started with uh, uh, a connection uh, which sits in the adjoint of E8, okay, so the adjoint of E8 is a 248-dimensional representation, and uh, now I want to decompose it under the maximal subgroup SU3 times E6. So E8 has a maximal <coughs> subgroup SU3 times E6, and so the spin connection obviously is going to uh, 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 be identified with that part. And so now, let, now let's just decompose um, this 248-dimensional adjoint representation, and it decomposes into four pieces. Um, so the first piece is the 327, where the 3 is the fundamental representation of SU3, and the 27 is the 27-dimensional representation of E6. Then you get the complex conjugates. Then I get the 178, so it's the singlet of SU3, and the 78 is the adjoint representation of E6. And finally I get 81, the 8 here is the adjoint representation of SU3. Um, so now I want to take uh, my uh, Dobo cohomology, and remember the, these Dobo cohomology groups are really zero p forms valued in uh, a bundle, which is the adjoint representation of E8. Okay, so now I take this adjoint representation and I decompose it into these pieces and uh, identify the various representations of SU3 here with various bundles that uh, uh, they correspond to. Okay, so then we get some decomposition of uh, the double cohomology. And, um, okay, so you get, uh, there are four pieces here, so I'm gonna get four pieces here. Uh, so let me just uh, discuss the first one. So the three here, so uh, you want to remember that uh, uh, tangent vectors um, uh, transform under the SU3, transform as the, uh, uh, as the fundamental representation under the SU3 holonomy group. So when you do parallel transport of tangent vectors, right? Uh, the tension vectors uh, f uh, form a representation of SU3, and that's exactly the fundamental three uh, 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 dimensional representation of SU3. Okay, so um, uh, this here, this piece here from the three here, you get the tangent bundle. Okay, and SU3 doesn't act at all on this 27. Well, you get some multiplicity, uh, uh, which is a 27 dimensional representation of E6, and so that's that multiplicity that you have over here. Uh, similarly for the three bars, the anti-fundamental representation, well, it's, it's cotangent vectors which transform in the, uh, uh, under holonomies as the uh, anti-fundamental representation of SU3. So from that piece, I get this one. And then from this one over here, uh, well, um, this is a singlet representation of SU3. So here I just get uh, a trivial line bundle, O sub X here just denotes a trivial uh, line bundle. So as a, as a space, it's just uh, X times, uh, times a copy of C complex plane. And uh, this one here, this turns out to be some traceless endomorphism bundle, right? It comes from three tens of three bar and project out the trace. Okay, so now given what we said on the previous transparency, just uh, if we flash it again, so now we wanna look at the degree zero and the degree one cohomology. Um, so uh, for p equals zero, what do we get? Well, let's look at the first piece here. Um, so, um, uh, so we get something that transforms in a 27-dimensional representation of E6, um, uh, and um, uh, how many of those do we get? Well, H0 of Tx, which is global holomorphic sections of the tangent bundle. Okay. Uh, but the tangent bundle does, of a Calabria threefold doesn't have any global holomorphic sections. Basically, that's a stability condition, 
if it had a global holomorphic section, that's essentially a map from a trivial line bundle into T of X. In other words, it's a holomorphic, it defines a holomorphic subbundle of T of X. Um, uh, but uh, the degree of a trivial line bundle is zero, and the degree of a SU3 bundle is also zero. Okay, uh, so you would have uh, so this would violate the stability condition, but we know this is stable, right? We discussed quite some extent that uh, satisfies your mission your mills, so that's a stable bundle. Uh, so this degree zero cohomology group just zero. You don't get anything from that. Okay. Um, similarly, I've told you that for uh, adjoint associated. Other associated bundles, uh, which you construct from this, are also stable. So uh, the cotangent bundle is also stable, and H0 of that also vanishes. This, this anamorphism bundle, H0 of that also vanishes. And so the only piece you're going to get is this piece. And this HP of O, uh, that corresponds to the Hodge number H00 of X. And um, given the relation between the Hodge numbers and the Betty numbers that we discussed, this is just B0. In other words, it's just uh, one dimensional. Okay, so you're just going to get a single copy of the 78, and 78 is the adjoint representation of E6. Okay, so the only unbroken gauge generators we get sit in the adjoint representation of 78, and that gives you a gauge field in the 78 adjoint of E6. So we're going to get an unbroken gauge group, which is E6 in four dimensions. Uh, the next one we want to discuss, we want to discuss the matter fields. The matter fields correspond to P equals 1. Okay, so now let's do p equals one. Well, um, I'm going to get h1 t of x, uh, um, uh, whatever that, that number is, this is the bulk homology group, the dimension of this is the bulk homology group, uh, times the 27. So that gives me uh, h1 t of x chirals in the 27. And from this one, I'm going to get h1 t star of x uh, 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 chirals in the 27 bar. And uh, this is, is going to be h1 zero. It's Hodge number H10 of X uh, times the 78, but on the Calabi-R, we saw that H10 is equal to zero, so that doesn't give you anything. And from here, you're going to get some H1. Okay, you're going to get a bunch of singlets. So these are singlets of the uh, E6. Okay. Uh, now, what are these things? Again, we can relate this to the Hodge numbers. So what's H1 and T star of X? Uh, well, it's a zero one form with values in one zero forms. In other words, it's a one one form. So this is just H11 of X. So I get H11 of X chirals in the 27 bar. In H12 of X, what's that? Well, it's H1 with values in the tangent bundle of X, values in tangent vectors. But um, it, I, can, uh, I can take a holomorphic 3 0 form and contract it with a tangent vector to get a 2 0 form. <coughs> Uh, so these are actually, you can identify this with uh, zero one forms with values in two zero forms. In other words, these are two comma one forms. Um, so this is counted by H two comma one of X. Okay. So I get H two comma one of X carols in the 27. And uh, in addition, I have a bunch of singlets, but they're not charged under the E6. And so what we end up with in four dimensions from this, we get a uh, uh, six uh, gauge group, basically an E6 grand unified theory. If you remember your grand unified theory, this is one of the possible grand unified gauge groups, right? So you have SU3 times SU2 times SU1, embeds in SU5, embeds in SO10, and embeds in E6. And um, with matter in the 27 and the 27 bar, and if you remember your grand unified theory, so all the quarks and leptons sit in a, a five and a 10 bar, which goes into the 16 of SO10, which then goes into the 27 of E6. Um, so this is a grand unified theory with the E6 gauge group. And uh, the net number of generations is given by the difference between these two numbers. So there's H21, H21 minus H11 of X, uh, uh, number of chiral generations uh, in the 27. And uh, if you uh, remember the relation between the Hodge numbers and the Betty numbers, this is actually uh, minus the Euler character of the Calabi-R up to a factor of two. So the factor of, of two that comes in the number of generations, that is, I mean, that depends on the embedding that you choose. The fact that I, I, you just have to look at, so, um, uh, so what's the Hodge diamond, right? So uh, basically H21 appears twice in a way, right? Because you have H21 and H12. H11 is also because twice, really, because I have H11 and I have H22. <laughs> right, so. 
essentially that's where that's where I get factored to. Yeah, so in fact, the, these is, uh, the order character rule is right, it's going to be even because of just the symmetry of the Hodge diamond. Okay, so uh, remarkably, we started with uh, we started with all this abstract stuff. We started with E8 times E8 heterotic string theory in ten dimensions, <laughs> lots of symmetry. Okay, and then we just required n equals one supersymmetry. Get a Calabial. We get a Hermitian Mills connection from the tangible of the Calabial. We use it uh, to break the gauge group, and voila. Out comes uh, E6 grand unified theory with, uh, okay, chi of x generations. Now, if you use the quintic, remember the quintic at h21 is 101, and h11 equals 1. So that gives 100 generations. Well, that's <laughs> embarrassing. All right. But then there's the uh, Tian Yao manifold, which I also briefly mentioned, and the Tian Yao manifold has Euler character uh, 18. And the Tian Yao manifold had a freely acting C3 symmetry, which you can mod out by, and that reduces the Euler character to six. And um, divide that by two, that's three generations. So if I uh, compactify on the Tian Yao manifold and do this construction, I end up with a grand unified theory of E6 gauge group and three generations. That's, in fact, uh, the reason why the Tian Yao manifold is very, uh, so famous. It was really, uh, well, if not the first, certainly one of the first examples. Um, uh, where you just get naturally three generations out of uh, a string construction. Okay, so um, so when this uh, story was discovered in the mid '80s, um, okay, so it's uh, it's of course quite remarkable. So uh, in quick succession, we suddenly have a complete theory of quantum gravity, so string theory. And uh, then you find, the hetero you find the heterotic string, which has this E8 gauge groups. It smells like grand unified theory. And then you start doing compactification. And uh, even a fairly simple compactification, like this uh, uh, standard embedding, already gives you a grand unified theory with a um, uh, very semi-realistic uh, looking thing with um, three generations, if you use the Tian Yao manifold. Okay, so this is all rather remarkable. And uh, so it created waves around the world and appeared, uh, spawned lots of magazine articles. In fact, the first time I heard about it was when I was uh, uh, a lot younger. <laughs> and I learned it from this magazine. It's Cake Mag Magazine. It's a uh, scientific magazine in the Netherlands. So just for nostalgic reasons, I thought I'd show you the article. This is from August 1987. Uh, of course, it's in Dutch, so I'm sorry. I'm going to have to translate a few things for you. Uh, but uh, okay, it says the lost. It's uh, called the lost world of Calabiao, and it basically tries to tell the story about Calabiao compactifications and, uh, of the heterotic string with E8 times E8 gauge group. Uh, and uh, okay, so it goes on here. Some more pictures it tries to uh, explain how it fits into this, uh, you know, into grand unified theories and the theory of everything unifying with gravity and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, okay, so maybe I just translate just for fun of it. I'll translate uh, a few sentences. Okay, blah blah blah. Okay, I, of course, the first sentence in any popular scientific magazine involves Einstein because Einstein anticipated everything. And uh, okay, uh, Green and Schwartz, uh, right? Uh, according to both scientists, that is Green and Schwartz, there exists an invisible shadow world uh, in six dimensions. Uh, mathematicians and physicists uh, have been uh, have gotten very excited about this new theory. Right. And so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, like uh, most of these articles, uh, there are usually also a couple of errors and some misrepresentations. And uh, rep yeah, the misrepresentations start with this picture. So um, this is supposed to be an artist's impression of a Calabial compactification. So. <laughs> 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 So um, if I get it right, well, it's explained over here. So I think this over here, the orange uh, uh, line, this is supposed to be Minkowski space. So that's supposed to be where we live. Okay, and you can see various buildings and mosques and other things like that. And uh, then this uh, uh, thing that you see going over here, this is supposed to be the, the, uh, the six dimensions of the Calabial. Okay. And uh, the way the artist has drawn it, it looks like there are buildings and perhaps people living in there in the extra dimensions. Uh, in the shadow world, and of course, that's not really the way it works. <laughs> um, okay, you have to understand the challenges of explaining this to the general public. Uh, 
Okay, so I just thought I'd show it for fun. Okay, so I think that's uh, um, that's um, that's um, quite extensive discussion we've had of the heterotic string. Um, so now I want to go and talk about our perturbative to be compactifications a little bit. And this section is going to be quite a bit shorter. Um, uh, there's a lot of things I won't discuss, um, but um, there's some basics that I would like to briefly go through, especially because I want to use them as a setup for F theory. Okay, so again, uh, we start in 10 space time dimensions, and, uh, but this time, instead of n equals 1 supersymmetry, we have n equals 2 supersymmetry, which means we have um, two supersymmetry transformations, two Majorana while spinners, oh, um, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Uh, written here, down here, which parameterize the two 10-dimensional supersymmetry transformations. And the bosonic fields are now a metric. Uh, again, there's an anti-symmetric tensor field, and there's a dilaton. Uh, this time, we don't have a gauge field. This time, we have a set of ramon ramon anti-symmetric tensor fields, and in type 2b, it's C0. It's a two-index tensor field, and it's a four-index tensor field. And this four-index tensor field has a self-duality condition, uh, which, which is why I denoted it with a plus up there. Okay. So we're going to do much the same thing. We're going to try and compactify this down to four dimensions. Um, taking the Kaluza Klein ansatz of the Minkowski space times x6, where x6 is an internal manifold. And uh, we're going to set the fluxes to zero, just as we did for the heterotic string. The fluxes here being not just the flux of B, but also the fluxes of the ramon ramon fields. Okay. And uh, then we're, uh, we're going to look for compactifications which preserve uh, some supersymmetry. So we want to find some unbroken supersymmetry generators. And, um, um, okay, so uh, again, then these, uh, the 10-dimensional supersymmetry transformation simplify if we set all the fluxes to zero. And, um, okay, so we now have two gravitinos, and the supersymmetry transformations are the first gravitino goes like covariantly, uh, goes like covariant derivative of epsilon one, and the second gravitino goes like the covariant derivative of epsilon two. Okay. So um, these are exactly the same equations that we encountered in the heterotic string. Okay, so you can solve either one of them, it's equivalent. Um, so you do exactly the same thing as we did before, and you find that uh, uh, x6 has to have a covariantly constant spinner, therefore it must be Calabi-L. Okay. But now comes the difference with the heterotic string. If in the heterotic string we only had epsilon 1, we didn't have an epsilon 2. So now when we do this reduction, we're going to get twice as many supersymmetry, twice as much supersymmetry as we have for the heterotic string. So if we move one covariantly constant spinner, just the minimal you can have on a uh, six-dimensional manifold, um, uh, corresponding to a Calabi manifold, we now end up with n equals two supersymmetry in four dimensions instead of n equals one supersymmetry. Okay, so we want to break it to n equals one supersymmetry eventually, but just for uh, the moment, let's just stick to n equals two supersymmetry for a little bit. Okay, so um, the multiplets. Um, uh, for n equals 2 supersymmetry are a little bit bigger than for n equals 1 supersymmetry. Uh, so uh, the main multiplets that you want to think about are the gravity multiplet, the vector multiplet, and the hypermultiplet. The gravity multiplet, so the bosonic fields in these multiplets, uh, for the gravity multiplet, it's a graviton and a gravity photon. For the vector multiplet, it's a, a vector and a complex scalar. And uh, for a hypermultiplet, it's two complex scalar or equivalently four uh, real scalars. Okay? Now, um, again, so uh, you want to compactify, you want to get the, uh, uh, the massless effective uh, four-dimensional theory, you want to find the massless fields of four dimensions. Now, the reduction, of, um, the reduction of, um, of the metric and of the B field is exactly the same as it was before. Nothing changes there. So you can get Kähler moduli, complex structure moduli, complexified Kähler moduli, okay? Uh, but now you're going to have to pair them with modes of ramon ramon fields to, pu uh, to put them together into n equals 2 multiplets. So in n equals 2 multiplet, half of them will be these modes that we discussed before from the NSNS sector. And uh, now we're going to get another half, which comes from reduction of the ramon ramon sector, completing uh, n equals 2 multiplets. Okay. So, um, right. So um, now... Uh, uh, much like for the B field, uh, if you're interested in the massless modes of these anti-symmetric tensor fields, then you're interested in harmonic forms on this internal manifold. Basic reason being, right, that the, um, uh, the kinetic operator that you get from the, uh, uh, from the Lagrangian 
the internal part of the kinetic operator uh, is just uh, uh, the Laplacian, uh, and uh, at least if you impose appropriate gauge conditions, just the Laplacian. And um, so um, the eigenmodes of the Laplacian, you're interested in the eigenmodes of the Laplacian and the eigenmodes with zero eigenvalue in the harmonic forms to give you the massless field. Of course, there are also eigenmodes with non-zero eigenvalue and they correspond to the massive modes of four dimensions. In other words, they correspond to Kaluza Klein modes. We're just going to do the massless modes, so we want the harmonic forms. Okay, so for example, let's do vector multiplet. Um, so how do you get a vector? Well, you take this uh, four index anti-symmetric tensor field and to get a vector in four dimensions, I have one index in four dimensions, it means that the remaining three indices must be along the internal space, along the Calabria. So I want to have harmonic um, three forms on the Calabria. And uh, as we discussed, there's a, uh, for every cohomology class, there's a unique harmonic representative. So the number of these harmonic classes is counted by the Betty number B3 of the Calabria, okay? And now if you remember the Hodge diamond, uh, um, how many of those are there? Well, I get H30, H2, which is one, and then H21 plus H12 and H03. So I get two H21 plus two, so it's three forms. And therefore, two H21 uh, plus two um, uh, 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 U1 gauge fields in four dimensions. Masses U1 gauge fields in four dimensions. Of course, there are also massive fields from, from uh, massive KK modes, which we just do the massless ones. Uh, but that's not quite right um, because there's a self duality condition. Self duality condition effectively relates uh, uh, this expansion, uh, coefficient of this expansion in a given form with its uh, Hodge dual. So um, uh, the self duality condition actually eliminates half of them, so we just have H21 plus 1. And um, uh, now remember that we had H2, 1 complex structure moduli, so H2, 1 of these U1 gauge fields na uh, naturally pair up with uh, H2, 1 complex structure moduli into uh, n equals 2 vector multiplet. So that's what we have over here. And then we have one remaining, um, uh, uh, then we have one remaining U1 gauge field, which comes from linear combination of H3, 0, and 0, 3. And uh, well, it's universal, of course, because it's for any Calabria manifold, you have a free form. Um, so that, since it's universal, of course, it's got to pair up with the, um, with the graviton in the gravity multiplet. So that's the one you have over here. Okay, similarly, you can find the remaining massless mode. So let's just quickly go through it. So we have these other tensor fields, uh, B2 and C2, and I can expand them in harmonic two forms, which give me a bunch of pseudoscalars in four dimensions. Uh, I can also take C4 and expand it in harmonic four forms and get another bunch of pseudoscalars in four dimensions. And uh, now remember that uh, Kähler deformations uh, also had to do with two forms, right, one, one forms. So uh, I can naturally take these things, in fact, right, remember that uh, uh, these were in fact naturally, so this was in fact naturally paired with Kähler moduli because we had this complexified Kähler moduli. So if you combine these modes, the, the Bs, the Cs, and the Ds with Kähler moduli, you get precisely four times H11 scalars, which naturally fit into H11 hypermultiplets. Yeah? So from this expansion, we get H11 hypermultiplets. And then what else can we get? Well, we have the axial dilaton in 10 dimensions, so that just gives you a uh, coupling in two fields in four dimensions. And I can also take these anti-symmetric tensor fields and take both of the indices in the four-dimensional space-time. That gives tensors in the four-dimensional space-time. But two index tensors in four dimensions are dual to scalars in four dimensions. <laughs> two to scalars in four dimensions. Two to hard tools. So that gives me another two scalars. So this naturally gives me another set of four scalars, and that gives one final hypermultiplet. So in total, therefore, you get H11 plus one hypermultiplets. You think there are other forms, expansion that you can do, you see that they're all related to the ones that I've discussed here. All right, so now we like to go on and break uh, this to n equals one supersymmetry in four dimensions. And um, there are basically two ways to go and do that. Uh, one is to turn on fluxes, and that leads to the whole story of flux superpotentials and so on. Uh, okay, that's, that's another long story. Unfortunately, I don't have time for it. Uh, the other thing you can do is study defects. Um, uh, you can consider, you can add, you can add D brains and O planes to your compactification. Uh, that breaks um, if you if you uh, 
if you choose them nicely, they break precisely one half of the supersymmetry. Um, so that will also break n equals two to n equals one. So I'm mostly going to focus on. Uh, I'm really going to focus just on the on the on the on the defects for a little while um, because I, basically, as I said, I want to lead up to F theory. Okay, so um, perturbative to B has two basic C2 symmetries. Um, it has a world sheet parity, which just interchanges the left and the right movers. So the way that it acts on the bosonic fields is it uh, interchanges the signs of the axion, the four form, and uh, one of the two forms. Uh, so you can check that that's a symmetry of the Lagrangian if you look at the Lagrangian for type to B theory. And uh, then there's minus one to the F left, uh, which is a symmetry with excess minus one on the field if it corresponds to, uh, 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 if it comes, comes from a string mode whose left movers are in the Ramon sector. And so these are all the Ramon, Ramon fields, have the left movers in the Ramon sector, <laughs> so they all get mapped to minus themselves. Of course, these symmetries also act on the, the fermions, so this symmetry will interchange the two gravitinos. And this one uh, uh, acts as minus one on one of the gravitinos, but not on the other one. Okay. Um, so, um, so you want to consider orbifolds by these kind of symmetries, and in fact, we want to uh, uh, consider orbifolds also that involve a further involution, sigma of x six. So the composition of two or three or whatever number of involutions is still an involution. I'm going to compose a few involutions to get some interesting com composite involution and I'm going to use that involution to orbifold. Um, so, uh, and now, uh, by definition, an orientifold is an orbifold that involves, um, uh, that involves uh, a parity uh, involution and possibly some of these other involutions, but it has to involve parity involution. Okay? Uh, now, uh, sigma will typically have some fixed locus uh, uh, on X6, uh, so locus that's mapped to itself under this involution. So this fixed locus is what we call an O-plane, orientifold plane. And uh, there, are, there are basic, in the, so in these kind of compactifications, the two basic uh, orientifolds that we, we consider, um, if we want to preserve n equals one supersymmetry, um, there's uh, minus one to the F left times, pa times parity times uh, sigma, where sigma is required to be holomorphic and maps omega three zero to minus omega three zero. Uh, so this preserves precisely one linear combination of, uh, of these two spinners, epsilon one and epsilon two. I think it's epsilon one minus i epsilon two, if I remember correctly. And um, the, the type of object that this leads to is O3 or O7 planes. Um, but, uh, um, look, why, why do I get O7 planes, for example? Well, O7 planes would be the fixed locus. So I have three coordinates in my Calabial, Z1, Z2, Z3. Okay, now let's take something that looks locally like Z3 goes to minus Z3. Okay, and the fixed locus is C3 equals zero, so that gives me a 07 plane. And if you remember that um, uh, omega 30 locally looks like DZ1 with DZ2 with DZ3, right? If Z3 goes to minus Z3, that means that omega goes to minus omega. Okay, so this is a quick way to see the relation um, between 03, 07, well, 07 planes and this kind of involution. Okay, the other option uh, which you could do is you could not involve minus one to the F left. Um, in that case, you, want, you still want sigma holomorphic and map omega three to itself. Uh, this situation is compatible with O5 or O9 planes, um, but um, I, don't, I don't really want to do this one. I want to concentrate on this one, uh, which gives you the O7 planes. Now, finding, okay, so, uh, you might be thinking at this point, how do we go about finding a Calabiao of involution? We've hardly discussed, uh, uh, I mean, the only Calabiaos we discussed so far is like the Quintic and the Tian Yao manifold. And how, do, how on earth do you find involution on those things? Well, um, there's actually a simpler way to do it. You, can just con uh, you could just construct a manifold which has an involution by construction and which is Calabiao. Um, so um, let's be explicit about it and just do that here. So. Um, uh, so we want to construct an x6, so that x6 mod z2 gives you b3, okay? And what we're going to do now is we're going to go the other way around. We start with b3, and now we're going to construct a double cover of it, which will be x6. And the double cover will have, will have an automatic involution, and it will be Calabia. Okay, so that's this picture here. So I'm going to start with b3, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to consider an equation of the form psi squared equals b2. Psi is basically this direction, okay? So it's a quadratic equation. 
and B2 is going to be some polynomial on B3. And uh, this has two solutions, so, um, 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 so I get two sheets covering B3, so that's what I call the double cover, okay? And this has a natural involution, just take psi to minus psi, all right? And now the only problem is to choose the degree of this polynomial correctly such that the double cover is a Calabi Yau. Okay? And I claim that this works uh, precisely when, so uh, if you take B3 and we define K to be the canonical bundle of B3, so canonical bundle is by definition the top exterior power of the cotangent bundle, it's a line bundle which we already encountered many times. Okay? So um, basically you want uh, B2 to be a section of K B3 to the minus 2. Uh, so, for example, if you would take C, C, if you would take B3 equals CP3, a um, complex projective space of dimension three, okay, uh, uh, K of B3 turns out to be O minus four, and so section, sections of K to B3 minus two, they just turn out to be polynomials of degree eight and CP3. Can't be any simpler than that. Just write a polynomial of degree eight and CP3. Use this equation, okay? So now I get a double cover of CP3. They claim that's a Calabi-R. That's another construction of calabi -Rs. But this one naturally has an evolution. Uh, moreover, it has fixed points. So, uh, so if B2 is a polynomial on B3, okay, well, it's going to have some vanishing locus. Uh, so what happens at the vanishing locus? Okay, you can try to draw it over here. That's a fixed point of the evolution. Right, where Xi gets mapped to, uh, Xi goes to minus Xi, well, Xi is zero there, so it gets mapped to itself. So on B2 equals zero, that's the fixed locus, so that's the orientable plane. Okay. Okay, the other object we need is D-brains. So, um, by definition, a D-brain is just a defect in which fundamental strings can end. That's, that's the D-brain. The lower on uh, the low energy world volume theory on a D brain is uh, turns out to be dimensional reduction of the 10 dimensional CBR Mills theory. So you just take the 10 dimensional CBR Mills theory and do a dimensional reduction from, I don't know, if it's, a D, if it's a D7 brain, you do a dimensional reduction from 10 down to 8 dimensions. If it's a D6 brain, you do a dimensional reduction from 10 down to 7 dimensions, and so on. Okay? So that's a very simple way to think about the world volume theory. Um, now, uh, uh, the other thing, of course, uh, famous fact about uh, D-brains is that when you have a stack of n parallel D-brains, I've drawn only two of them here, and then you let them approach each other, so there's a one gate symmetry associated with, associated with each brain, but now if you let them approach each other and then they coincide, the gate symmetry actually enhances from U1 to the n to U to the n, to, to UN, excuse me. And uh, the reason for that is that, uh, um, uh, apart from these strings which go from, uh, from a brain to itself, we have another open string sector which goes from one brain to another brain. And you can quantize that, and uh, that gives you uh, uh, the W bosons of this broken UN gauge group. And the mass of these W bosons is proportional to the, uh, the length of the string, so the distance between these two brains. So now when the brains approach each other and get on top of each other, these W bosons go to zero, and you get enhanced gate symmetry. Now, if you want to preserve the same supersymmetry that's preserved by uh, the ones which, which gave you O7 planes, so the minus one to the left P sigma, um, so uh, then uh, that's also the same supersymmetry which would preserve D7 brains and D3 brains, uh, at least if you wrap them on holomorphic submanifolds of X6. And for D3 brains, you have to localize the points in X6. Yeah, I'm stating that. I didn't derive it here, but they can derive that. Okay, um, okay, uh, this slide, okay, so I do this. Yeah, I tried to squeeze this in, but I didn't re don't really need it for anything else, but just for general ed educational purposes. Um, let's, let's say a little bit more about this world volume theory and try to make a connection with some of the things that we saw for heterotic strings, okay? Uh, but I'm not gonna use this for anything either today or tomorrow, so if you wish. Um, don't have to understand it. Um, so let's suppose we have a stack of these seven brains with some UN gate symmetry, and now let's wrap it on the holomorphic submanifold S of X. Uh, particularly for D7 brains, I want to wrap them on a four cycle, that is a complex surface inside the Calabi Yau. And uh, let's look at the equations for these word volume fields. So the bosonic fields, again, it's the dimensional reduction of 10 dimensional meals, so it's eight dimensional meals, which has an eight dimensional gauge field, 
They have a dimensional reduction. Two of the components of the gauge field get converted to two scalars, right? Adjoint scalars. And usually we combine them in a, a single complex scalar. And the complex scalar, if you remember uh, the way that this works, um, uh, this complex scalar describes uh, uh, deformations of the D-brain in the, in the direction normal to it. So if you move around the expectation value phi, you're essentially moving around the D-brain, uh, uh, the D7-brain in this case, in the higher dimensional space-time. Okay. Uh, it probably should come as no surprise that the, uh, since the world volume theory is uh, dimensional reduction of, uh, uh, of, um, of 10 dimensional young mills, which is what we saw for the heterotic string, it probably should come as no surprise that the, um, uh, the equations, uh, if you want to preserve supersymmetry, the equations that uh, uh, the gauge field A and uh, the adjoint field phi has to satisfy are just the dimensional reduction of the Hermitian young mills equations that we saw for the heterotic string. So we can do that. So how do we do dimensional reduction? Uh, well, we take, we take our hermitian and mills connection. So it had three components, right? DZ1 bar, DZ2 bar, DZ3 bar. And it depended on three coordinates, Z1, Z2, and Z3. And the way we do dimensional reduction is, first of all, we make things independent of Z3. So things depend just on Z1 and Z2. And we replace the, uh, uh, the DC3 bar uh, uh, component of the gauge field to replace that by the complex adjoint field. Okay? And now you just substitute that into the Hermitian and Mills equations and you get some set of equations, uh, which uh, after some manipulation, uh, I'll say a little more about it, essentially is this set of equations. Okay? So that's dimensional reduction of the Hermitian and Mills equations. And that's, those are the equations that should be satisfied if you want to preserve Helix 1 supersymmetry. Um, Okay, uh, so a uh, few words to say about this. Um, so first of all, um, phi uh, in general, it, uh, phi should be thought of, then as I said, it, it, it describes displacements of the D-brains in, in the normal direction to the D-brain. So uh, usually it takes values in the normal bundle to the submanifolds in which it is wrapped. And uh, you can now use the, uh, in this case, you can use the holomorphic free zero form to map a section of the normal bundle to a 2 comma 0 form on S, okay? So you can think of phi here, uh, in this case that we're discussing, the seven brains wrapped in holomorphic force cycles, you can think of them as 2 comma 0 forms on S. Now there's something funny going on here in that 2 comma 0 forms on S transform under the Lorentz group of the world volume theory of the seven brain. Right? So um, phi normally doesn't transform under uh, Lorentz transformations along the seven brain world volume, it does transform under a U on R symmetry, which is this R charge uh, one or one half, I forgot. Uh, but what's happened here is that by, uh, uh, when it's wrapped, when it's wrapped uh, on, uh, on a uh, submanifold of a clavial, uh, you can identify with the two comma zero form, which does um, transform under a certain U one part of the Lorentz group along the seven brain. Uh, so this is the general phenomenon of topological twisting the fact that the R symmetry, this is the U on R in which the phi is charged, gets identified with some subgroup of the Lorentz group um, of the work volume gauge theory. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, so in particular, so what you find here is that this uh, Jan Mills theory uh, on the seven brain is actually topologically twisted, Jan Mills theory. Okay. This is actually a fairly general story. Um, so I did it here for the seven brains. Um, but this happens fairly generally. You have some brains on some, some manifolds. You always find it's the top uh, in a, some special holonomy manifold. Uh, you find this very typical situation that the world volume theory is topologically twisted. Okay, now uh, once things are two comma zero forms, uh, I can write these equations that I've written here. Um, so the dimensionally reduced Hermitian and Mills equations, uh, so there's now a set of equations on, uh, on S, on the thing on which this seven brains are wrapped. Uh, so it says that F0 to is zero, phi has to be uh, uh, holomorphic. And then uh, there's this condition. This comes from the reduction of the uh, Kähler trace. Remember, we gij bar, fij bar in heterotic strings. If you reduce that, you get this equation. This is basically gij bar, fij bar, and you get a commutative phi phi term. And the whole story is basically now similar to what we saw for the heterotic string. So for the heterotic string, we saw that Hermitian and Mills corresponds to a polystable holomorphic bundle. And it's the same story here, essentially. So the first two equations here now give you a Hickey bundle, which means it's a holomorphic bundle with a holomorphic section of the adjoint bundle, well, twisted, adjoint, twisted by two comma zero forms. So that's like the analog of the holomorphic bundle in the heterotic string. 
And this equation, well, uh, uh, good luck trying to solve it, <laughs> but um, it's, uh, uh, it's equivalent to uh, saying that the Higgs bundle is polystable, where uh, uh, the slope of a Higgs bundle is just the slope of the, of the bundle. Even the proof uses of this fact uses, um, uses Donaldson, Ulbeck, and Yao. Yeah, so it's completely analogous. Okay, so uh, these equations, again, you'll see them fairly often if you do this kind of dimensional reduction. So uh, it's, it should remind you of Hitchin's equations. Uh, so Hitchin studied dimensional reduction of the anti-self-duality equations, four down to two dimensions, and you got equations which look very much like this. So this is a general story, actually, that you find uh, for brains in, um, in the club hours and special anatomy manifold. Okay, as I said, this is for educational purposes. I'm not going to use it all, actually. Okay, um, I did want to be a bit more concrete um, about the, the typical cycle that a D-brain can wrap in uh, a Calabi out geometry when there's also an orientifold present. Um, at some point, I'll show you that this comes very nicely out of F-theory. So I just want to briefly uh, uh, pass on, uh, go through that. Um, so um, we want to wrap a D7 brain on, uh, and now let's just discuss a generic D7 brain on series stack. Just most generic situation where I have a D7 brain wrapped as a holomorphic submanifold of X6. And we're also going to assume we have orientifolds present already. And so we, uh, uh, again, we take this construction where we, we start with B3 and we take a double cover to get X6, which is a natural involution. It's given by an equation xi squared equals B2, where B2 equals zero gives you the orientifold plane. Okay, and now I want to add some D brains to that uh, to get some uh, N equals one compactification. Now there's a story here that uh, I didn't really uh, I didn't really touch on, but uh, when you do these kind of uh, when you start adding brains, um, you have to be careful that uh, that certain tuple cancellation conditions are satisfied. So uh, these brains, the O planes, and also the D brains, they generate their their sources for the normal flux, and there's the, there's an appropriate version of Gauss's law that you have to satisfy, otherwise you have an inconsistent uh, compactification. You can't actually solve the equations of motion. So there's a kind of charge cancellation condition. Now, of course, the D7 brain, uh, famous facts about D brains is that they're the elementary Roman Ramon charges, uh, Roman uh, Ramon sources. So a D7 brain is a Roman Ramon charge plus one. Uh, O7 plane, is O7 minus plane is what I want here, uh, has Roman Ramon charge uh, minus four. O7 plus, I didn't really say what O7 minus O7 plus is, but okay, the O7 plus is a positive charge, so it wouldn't help you much. Uh, I said minus four here. Maybe some of you have seen that it has charge minus eight. Sometimes you see that it's, it's being said that it has charge minus eight. The difference is whether you're thinking about working on B3 or working on X6. If you work on X6, you should think of it as having charge minus eight. If you work downstairs on B3, you should think of it as having charge minus four. Okay, so you need a certain number of D7 brains to cancel the Ramon Ramon charge of this O7 plane. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, it doesn't work. You can't satisfy Gauss's law for some of the Ramon Ramon fields. And uh, the way it works out is that, um, so the O7 plane is wrapped in B2 equals zero. Then uh, I need the D7 brain to be wrapped on a manifold of type B8 equals zero, or B8 is a section of K B3 to the minus eight. So it was minus two for B2 and minus eight for B8. Uh, very, very briefly, why is that? Well, um, so what, 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 what sources are we talking about here? We're talking about the source for the uh, Roman axion. So it has a field strength, which is, um, uh, uh, which is one index, it's F1. And uh, Gauss's law then basically says that D of F1 has to be zero through any closed cycle, okay? Uh, so uh, let's take a closed cycle A. So D of F1 for that has to be zero, but it gets sources whenever the D7 brain intersects A and whenever the O7 plane intersects A. Okay, so this is supposed to be intersection number. So uh, let's say that A times D7 is the intersection between A and D7, and A dot O7 is the intersection between A and O7. But um, this, this is one unit of Ramon Ramon charge, this is minus four units of Ramon Ramon charge. So if you want no sources for F1 for the two, two cycle, if you want to satisfy Gauss's law through the two cycle, um, uh, this has to cancel, these intersection points have to cancel, it's to be zero net intersection. And that's precisely this condition of B8 is a section of KB to the minus eight. Now there's actually further subtlety, um, which I'm not gonna explain, but you can find explanation in the notes. Not 
just state it. Why did, <laughs> why did this you have to find in the nodes? Turns out that when a D7 and an O7 plane intersect, you can't have a generic intersection. It's not compatible with oriental folding. Uh, whenever the D7 uh, brain intersects an O7 plane, you have to have a kind of double intersection. There has to be another piece of the D7 coming in and intersecting it at the same time. In other words, uh, you get an equation. So let, let's set B, you get this equation basically where you set, uh, let's set B6 equal to one temporarily. So you get an equation for type xi squared equals something else squared which is singular, but it means you can factorize this xi minus something, xi plus something, so you have two d-brains which come in and intersect each other right at the oriental plane. Okay, so that's a necessary, so that's, um, that's necessary for consistency. And so the upshot is I can't have a generic section B8 equals zero, I need to have something of the form B2, B6 minus B4 squared equals zero, otherwise it's not consistent. Um, but this is now, this is it now, so, um, so what do I need if I want to write down uh, a compactification of type 2b with d brains and O7 planes? Uh, well, I, I can use, uh, say, CP3. I construct a double cover to get a Calabia. Okay, and then I take three polynomials, B2, B4, and B6. And B2 equals zero is my oriental plane. B2, B6 minus B4 squared equals zero is my D7 plane. Voila. Okay. The only thing you still need to do is to find a gauge field on top of it. But that's the complete generic form of a D707 compactification. Okay, uh, I have a very brief discussion of oriental actions on the deep brain. So, uh, of course, um, the world volume fields also, uh, you have to be careful that you project the world volume fields correctly when you do an oriental projection. Uh, so, um, uh, okay, the way it works is as follows parity basically uh, uh, takes uh, A to A transpose. And uh, of course, you have an action of sigma, so you also have to pull back along sigma. And it turns out that on the massless modes, there's a minus one. And uh, finally, um, uh, um, this only needs to be true up to a gauge transformation. So we, we, we actually do this up to a co constant gauge transformation, gamma inside UN. And it turns out there are basically two possibilities uh, either gamma inverse gamma transpose equals one to a gauge transformation. Well, okay, so. so so we want to have this, and we get a nice involution. Um, and it turns out that you have basically the following possibilities. You have either two stacks of brains which are interchanged. So I start with the UN gauge group here in this stack and UN gauge group on the other stack. And uh, then by coasting out, I just get a single UN gauge group on that stack. Okay, so that ends up with a UN gauge group. The other possibility is that, um, that a set a stack of brains gets mapped to itself, that means it's coincides with an oriental full plane. And then you can have either gamma transpose is equal to gamma, perhaps again up to a gauge transformation. Uh, you can put this in a standard form by taking gamma equal to the identity, and then you see that this just says that uh, uh, if you, after projection, you're left over with an SON gauge field. And on the other hand, the other possibility is gamma transpose equals minus gamma, which you can set equal to some kind of symplectic form. And uh, then if you um, project this out, you're left over with a USPN gauge symmetry, okay? So, um, by this way, you can generate all these classical gauge groups, UN, SON, and US, uh, USPN. Now, for the heterotic string, we had something similar. We had an SO32, and when you compactify it, you can also get SON, of course, and UN, and I think even USPN. Um, but um, there's also this other heterotic theory, E8 times E8 theory, which had exceptional gauge symmetry. But from this construction, you, from open strings, you don't get exceptional gate symmetry. Okay, you get the classical groups, you do not get the exceptional groups that we had for the heterotic string. So this will be different when we go to strong coupling, when we go to F theory, you actually do get exceptional gate groups. But just from ordinary open strings, you only get the classical gate groups. Okay. Um, finally, uh, what I need uh, from type 2b is the story of S-duality. So type 2b has an exact strong weak coupling duality, which takes the string coupling to one over the string coupling. Okay, it's one of the famous uh, dualities of string theory. Um, all the string theories have some kind of strong coupling behavior, and the 2b theory is self-dual under uh, taking the coupling to be large. Now, uh, it's usually more convenient to talk about the actual dilaton, which is this complex combination which involves the string coupling as well as the roll and axion. And uh, g string goes to 1 over g string, which corresponds to tall, goes to 1 over tall. 
And uh, further, uh, the Axion, of course, it's a pseudoscalar. It has a shift symmetry, so it's, uh, uh, the Lagrangian is invariant under, uh, if you define, if you redefine C0 to C0 plus some constant. It turns out that that's only uh, the instantons, uh, sorry, d brains. Uh, it's not invariant if you also have d brains present. If you have d brains present, then it's only invariant under a shift by one or a multiple of that. Um, now, how does that, that act on tall? Well, it just acts on this part, so it takes tall to tall plus one. And of course, these two generations, the famous fact that these two generations together, uh, they generate an SL2, SL2Z duality group, uh, which takes tall to A tall plus B, C tall plus D, where A, B, C, D is an uh, uh, integer matrix with determinant one. Okay? And um, just. Uh, at some point, I think I'll need it, that um, B2 and C2 t turn out the transformers are doublet under this SL2Z. <coughs> okay, now, uh, so what happens with a fundamental string when you take it to strong coupling? Well, it's identified with a D string of the dual theory. So S duality takes a fundamental string to a D string. Um, but that's just under this transformation. Now we could do general SL2Z transformations, right? Because these gen generate the whole SL2Z group. If you do general SL2C transformations, it, uh, you take a fundamental string to what's called a PQ string. So there's a, uh, an object in type to B, which is a PQ string, which is a bound state of P fundamental uh, strings and QD strings. Okay. A one zero string is just a fundamental string. A zero one string is a D string. And everything else is a bound state of fundamental strings and D strings. Okay. And then the final thing I need is, um, so we said that a D7 brain is a place where fundamental strings can end. Okay, now apply dualities, uh, you get PQ strings. And so, of course, by dualities, uh, uh, we then also get PQ7 brains. So we define a PQ7 brain to be a 7 brain where a PQ string can end. Okay, so that was really the lightning quick review of um, type to B. That's more or less all I need um, for the rest of the day and for tomorrow. Okay, so F theory is a little different uh, from what we've seen so far. So, so far we've seen 10-dimensional string theories with big string coupling, strings around, and uh, somehow what happens in F theory, so in F theory somehow what we want to do is we want to go to finite coupling and uh, it turns out that in some cases uh, you can make sense out of that. And um, all the structures that we've seen previously, they are somehow translated into geometry. They're somehow geometric structures. And um, um, the things we saw in type 2B in the heterotic string, they come out in certain limits, the limits of these structures. But this is somehow a bit more geometric uh, theory, um, and which, also happens to describe, uh, the um, which also happens to describe strings with finite coupling. Okay, so um, let's first um, remind ourselves a bit about elliptic curves. So an elliptic curve is just a two torus, and um, a two torus has two one cycles. Excuse me, it's a typo, there should be an H lower one. Well, of course, H upper one is also G2, but I want H lower one. So uh, H, one, uh, H lower one is generated by two two cycles. There's an A cycle and there's a B cycle. And the A cycle has self intersection zero, the B cycle has self intersection zero, and A and B intersect in, well, the way I drew it, it seems like there's two intersection points, but really there's only one intersection point over here. Okay. Um, um, so the two torus has a single uh, complex structure parameter, and the way we get it is as follows. Um, we take a holomorphic one zero form uh, on the elliptic curve. So it's a Clabiau, so it has a holomorphic one zero form, right? And, and now I just take the ratio of the B period and the A period. And if you remember that, okay, so holomorphic one zero form is not defined, it's only defined up to a scale, but if you take this ratio, then the scale cancels out. Okay? Uh, so we're going to use this period to parameterize the complex structure of a two torus. And um, so this is often called a modular parameter. And the reason that it's called a modular parameter is because uh, um, it, uh, there are certain identifications you have to make. Uh, so there are certain values of tall for which uh, uh, different values of tall for which you get the exact same elliptic curve. And so you want to identify them. Uh, 
Well, what are the, so uh, there are two basic symmetries. So, um, uh, so remember, so a torus is really uh, R2 divided by a lattice. And uh, there are two basic symmetries of the lattice. The first one has the effect of just, in, uh, which gives you the same two torus. The first one has just the effect of ch changing the A cycle and the B cycle, just permuting them. Okay. And if you see, look at this expression, well, if you permute the A cycle and the B cycle, um, that just takes tall goes to 1 over tall. And the other thing you can do, which uh, leaves the lattice invariant, um, has the effect of taking uh, uh, the A cycle to itself and the B cycle to uh, B cycle plus A cycle. Again, that will give you, um, so there's a symmetry that gives you the exact same elliptic curve. And the way that acts, if you do this uh, on tall, you find that tall goes to tall plus one, right? Because it's uh, B go to B plus A, so this goes to period of B plus period of A over period of A, so that's tall goes to tall plus one. Okay, now we just saw these, <laughs> we just saw these dualities, that's why I discussed them in type 2B. In uh, type 2B, we have an axiodiloton, uh, and um, in the uh, you also have to make these identifications due to S-duality and due to the shift symmetry of the axion, okay? So uh, the axiodiloton of type 2B behaves just like the uh, complex structure parameter of an elliptic curve. So uh, why don't we make use of that? So let's take our type 2B spacetime, and now let's just attach a torus to it at every point on the type 2B spacetime. And then we have to say what we mean by that. So what we mean by that is that um, uh, the uh, complex structure parameter of that extra torus that we attach to every point in our space-time, we're just going to identify that with our actual diloton. That's going to be our tall. Yeah? And then, of course, the torus is an area. We're just going to ignore the area of the torus or take it to be zero if you wish or something. Okay? So this construction uh, is called F-theory, and this is 12-dimensional compactification of F-theory because I started with 10 dimensions and I added two dimensions and now only 12 dimensions. This type of construction where we think of the uh, extra diloton as the complex structure parameter of an extra <laughs> torus, this type of construction is called an F-theory compactification. Okay, so just again in the picture, here we have the type to be space time. We add this torus whose complex structure is the extra diloton. And uh, now uh, we have 10 plus 2, which is 12 dimensions. Okay, now, um, it's not so interesting if you just take a constant torus. Uh, what we want to go and do now is we want to go and fiber this elliptic curve uh, over the type 2B spacetime. In other words, we're going to consider uh, uh, backgrounds where the actual diloton varies over the type 2B spacetime. Okay? So um, we want to write elliptic vibration. That is a vibration by elliptic curve over the type 2B spacetime. And uh, here's an explicit way to do that. So uh, you can think of, um, we already saw before that you can think of uh, elliptic curve as a cubic equation uh, in CP3. So here I've written it in a fine form. It's a cubic equation if I add an additional fine parameter. Y squared is x cubed plus fx plus g. So f and g are just coefficients. This is really an equation in y and x. It's two complex variables, one equation that gives you a curve. It's a cubic equation that's going to give you an elliptic curve, torus. Okay, so that's a nice way to write, uh, explicitly write the equation for an elliptic curve. And now we want to vary this over the type to be space time, which basically means that f and g are functions, are functions of um, coordinates on the type to be space time. More precisely, they're sections of certain line bundles over the type to be space time. Okay. Okay. And why do we do that? Well, the actual diloton, you see, the actual diloton is really. Uh, uh, if it's varying over the type to be spacetime, it's a really nasty thing to work with because uh, it typically has branch cuts. So it has this tall goes to tall plus one identification. It has this tall goes to one over tall back, uh, identification. And as you go around to type to be spacetime, you typically have to identify things, and so you're going to get branch cuts. It's the actual diloton is typically multi-valued over the type to be spacetime. So it's very nasty to work directly with the actual diloton varying extra diloton over the type to be space time. You have to do all these branch cuts. It's very nasty. In this way, it's very easy because we can specify a polynomial f and specify a polynomial g on the type to be space time, and they're completely globally defined. There's no branch cuts whatsoever. Okay, just a bunch of polynomials, CP3 or whatever. <laughs> There's no branch cuts. 
So this is much simpler to work with. And, um, and it still contains the same information because by computing the periods, I, you implicitly have, you've implicitly determined the actual dilaton. Yeah. But now I don't have to deal with all the multivalued, so this is a very efficient way to deal with the multivaluedness of the actual dilaton. That's why it's so nice. Uh, another important point that I have to make is that we are really considering varying actual dilaton over the type to be spacetime now. So it has, it has a non-trivial profile which means in particular that the string coupling is typically sum of order one, it's non-zero. So this is not a perturbative type to B compactification. In perturbative type to B, the string coupling has to be infinitesimally small, okay? Here it has some profile, it varies over the space time and typically it's somewhere of order one. So it's a little bit similar, uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's a little bit similar to m theory versus type 2A, okay? So M uh, type 2A is a string coupling and type 2A is really only valid if the string coupling is infinitesimally small, but you can go to strong coupling, give a, fi give a finite expectation value for the dilaton, and then you effectively work on with an m background, 11 dimension supergravity background, uh, which contains the type 2A space time plus an extra circle. Right? And the size of that circle can vary, but it's non-zero, non and that describes a finite uh, uh, two-way two strings at finite coupling. Now, uh, F and G depend on uh, coordinates on this type to be spacetime. And generically, you get a nice smooth elliptic curve, <laughs> yeah? But uh, it's not always like that. So uh, uh, if you tune the coefficients a little bit, then this elliptic curve can become singular, okay? If you're gonna vary it, that's gonna happen. It's bound to happen at some point. Uh, why? Well, you can just compute where it goes singular, and it turns out, uh, uh, it turns out to, uh, this curve turns out to go singular, when this particular combination is zero. This particular combination is 4f cubed plus 27g squared. F and g are these coefficients here. So this combination is often called the discriminant. And uh, when the discriminant vanishes, this elliptic curve has become singular. And the simplest way it can become singular, remember we had an A cycle and a B cycle, but the simplest way it can become singular is if, if one of the A cycles contracts the zero size, it pinches the zero size. Okay, and now I have a singular Singular point. That's the simplest way it can become singular. Okay, but um, remember that f and g, where functions are really sections, uh, line bundles over the type to be space time, and, and now uh, we have a single condition when this elliptic curve goes singular. Okay, so that's a single condition, a single complex condition. So this is going to happen over uh, uh, a codimension one. So where is delta equal to zero? Well, it's a co-dimension one subset in the type to be space time. Complex co-dimension one subset in the type to be space time. Real co-dimension two subset of the type to be space time. So we have this type to be space time. We have elliptic curve varying over it. And now there's some complex co-dimension one subsets of the type to be space time where this elliptic curve goes singular. Okay, now there's bound to be something interesting there. So let's try and figure out what it is. Okay, so, um, all right, so here I've tried to draw it. So um, here we have our type to be space time. Uh, so here, uh, away, from, away from this point over here, away from this uh, special point over here, I just have a smooth elliptic curve. And um, so for this special point here, the elliptic curve uh, becomes singular, and this is one cycle which is contracted to zero size. Okay. Now, um, uh, this situation is actually well studied in monodromy, what happens is that uh, there's a monotony on the cycles. So if I take a smooth elliptic curve and I transport it and then come back to myself, um, there's a monotony on the one cycles of that elliptic curve. So the, the elliptic curve comes back to itself, but the one cycles aren't quite the same. And they're related by the picard lefschetz formula. So if there's an A cycle shrinking to zero here, then uh, under this monotony, what happens is that AB goes to A, uh, B plus A. A here is the cycle that's shrunk to zero size, okay? And if you remember how that acted on, if you remember how that acted on the, um, if you remember how that acted on the uh, extra dilaton or on the smaller parameter, that corresponds to tall goes to tall plus one, okay? So, well, this is the simplest case where I assume that the A cycle goes to zero. In general, you would get tall goes to A tall plus B over C tall plus D, <coughs> which is the simple one, just the A cycle shrinks, okay? 
So um, you see that um, you see that there's a monotony. So there's a monotony of these cycles, but there's, therefore there's also a monotony of the actual dilaton around this locus where you get the singular fiber. Okay, so this was what I was talking about before. The actual dilaton in these compactifications is multivalued. There's a branch cut over here. Okay, and if you go across it, it all goes two plus one. But now, what does this mean from the type 2b perspective? Okay, well, uh, let's take a little disk here. Let's take a circle and it's floating with a disk. And uh, let's take the one one axion and let's take its field strength and try to integrate it over the disk. And, uh, well, what, what I really want to do, I, I want to integrate uh, the axion around the boundary of this disk. All right? So morally, that's this, but this can be singular in the interior. And, um, but now remember, so, so now I want, to, I want to compute the integral of uh, the Ramon axion around, around this circle here, which surrounds uh, uh, this discriminant locus. Uh, but now remember that um, tau goes to tau plus one, or equivalently, so uh, just above and below the branch cut, C jumps by one, <laughs> right? So, uh, I'm sorry? Shouldn't have what? Sorry. If you have D in the middle integral, D1 and the integration by parts. Um, do I do integration by parts? I'm just stuck, so I'll go to the boundary of the disk. Yeah, but how do you get the extremal value? This, the, the difference between them. So this is, this is what I was trying to say. So I, I'm gonna, so my zero and two pi, I'm gonna think of them as just being above and below the branch cut. Yeah, it's zero four. So to integrate this, you need oh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> oh, that's not good. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's a D here. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, and the source is of course a D of f. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, so. Uh, D of F is a two form and source is delta two, which is localized. Okay, so I ended, I got this screwed up. I'm sorry. So, right, so the source is actually, uh, a Roman mon flux is sourced by, uh, uh, for D of F1, so there should be an extra D here. Okay, fine, thank you. Yeah, okay, so this should be D. There should be Ds everywhere, add the Ds. But uh, the point is that there's, um, okay, so there's this jump. Okay, there's this jump as you cross the branch cut. And so as you jump the branch cut, um, um, so you end up with a value one for this integral, okay? And um, so what this means that, uh, again, if you add the D, okay, what this means is that there's a source for the ramon ramon axion sitting inside this disk, okay? And of course, I can contract the circle as much as I want, so the source is really associated with, uh, uh, with this discriminant here. And, um, Therefore, uh, well, we've seen before that uh, what's, what's, the thing that sources, what's the thing that sources one unit of Ramon Ramon flux? It's a D7 brain, okay? So from the type 2b perspective, this discriminant locus here, there's a D7 brain sitting here. That's what it means, okay? And that's for the simplest case where you have a, a one zero cycle string of the zero size. Uh, so more generally, um, if you have a PQ, uh, uh, if you have a PQ circle shrinking to zero size, you get this particular monotony, and it corresponds to a PQ seven brain. Okay, it's why I to see monotonies. Um, okay, do I want I have five minutes? Uh -huh. Okay, let me just get started on this. Okay, so I've tried to, so I've tried to motivate this f theory picture from a type 2b perspective. Okay, so we have this actual dilaton. We added an elliptic curve describing the modular parameter, describing this uh, uh, of the elliptic curve, identifying that with the actual dilaton. Uh, we have this elliptic vibration over the type 2b space-time, and we've seen that the, um, and we've seen that the singular fibers correspond to seven brains. These seven brains are PQ seven brains. Okay. Now, I want to discuss this from a slightly different perspective, which is the M theory perspective. And so, for the, for, uh, if, uh, at least for this slide, I'm going to temporarily completely forget about F theory, and in the next slide, we'll see how it's related to F theory. So, for just one slide, I have to talk to you about M theory. Okay? So, uh, M theory, well, when I mean by M theory, I'm really just going to look at 11 dimensional supergravity. 
And uh, what I'm going to be interested in, and what's going to be relevant for F theory, is you, if you consider a compactification of M theory uh, uh, with, uh, uh, down to three dimensions. So I start with 11 dimensions, and uh, I take a Kluzik Klein ansatz of the form Minkowski times eight dimensional real manifold. Okay. And uh, so this is a compactification of M theory down to three dimensions. And uh, further, uh, I want to preserve n equals two supersymmetry, right? This time I don't want to preserve n equals one supersymmetry, I want to preserve n equals two supersymmetry. The reason being that eventually this will be related to n equals one supersymmetry in four dimensions, but basically n equals one supersymmetry in four dimensions or just n equals two supersymmetry in three dimensions. Okay, um, so um, I want to have n equals two supersymmetry. Now, why is some eight dimensional real manifold and uh, just if you already see for the heterotic string, and just if we've already seen for um, uh, the type two string, there's the usual story. If you want to preserve some supersymmetry, you look at the supersymmetry variations, in this case, the 11 dimensional supersymmetry variations, and you're trying to find some unbroken generator. You're trying to find some supersymmetry that's not broken. And again, uh, there are fluxes here, but uh, I'm going to ignore them. I'm going to set the fluxes to zero. And then there's a gravitino. And so the usual equation is that the gravitino, the variation of the gravitino is proportional to a covariant derivative of a spinner. This is a three-dimensional part and an eight-dimensional part. Three-dimensional part is constant. And so preserving a supersymmetry equation, just as all the times we've seen before, uh, it corresponds to uh, uh, finding a covariantly constant spinner on this internal manifold Y. Okay? Uh, spinner here, uh, lives in the eight-dimensional chiral, positive chirality, spin representation of SO8. So spin representation of SO8 or eight-dimensional. Okay. So that story seems much like we've seen before. But uh, the difference here is that um, I need n equals two supersymmetry, not n equals one supersymmetry. Uh, so in order to get that, and I, since I started with a single spinner supersymmetry parameter in 11 dimensions, in order to get two uh, 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 unbroken supersymmetries that means I need two covariantly constant spinners on Y, not one. Okay. Okay, so we take this eight-dimensional spinner representation and uh, normally we would have decomposed this as one plus something else. Now I want two covariantly constant spinners. I really want to decompose this six plus one plus one and these two ones are the two covariantly constant spinners that I need to get n equals two supersymmetry. Okay. But what's the subgroup which fixes two spinners in, yes? Five one. Um, I'm, okay, yes. Okay. What's the subgroup that fixes uh, two spinners uh, inside SU8? Well, that's spin six. And spin six, if you remember, is SU4. Okay. So the holonomy group of this eight-dimensional manifold has to be SU4 if I want to get two covariant constant spinners. Okay. But SO, SU4 inside SO8, that's the usual, again, <laughs> so you start with a manifold which has SO8 holonomy, which is the generic thing, okay? Remember, if it's Kähler, it would have U4 holonomy, and if it's Calabiao, it would be SU4 holonomy, okay? So SU4 holonomy corresponds to a Calabiao fourfold. Okay? So we've seen Calabiao threefolds quite a bit now, but uh, in this story, if you want to take m theory compactifications from three dimensions uh, down to three dimensions n equals two supersymmetry, uh, what you end up needing is a Calabiao fourfold. So now we're going to talk about Calabiao fourfolds. Okay, so now we go and try and put f theory back into the game. So what I want to use to relate f theory to m theory is the following. Uh, we're going to use a, a relation between type 2b and uh, M theory, and it's the following relation in nine dimensions. So let's consider M theory compactified on an elliptic curve, M theory compactified on T2. So the claim is that this is equivalent to type 2B compactified on a circle of radius R. And that the way the identifications work is that the modular parameter, that is the, really the actual dilaton, well, sorry, right, so the modular parameter of T2 corresponds to the actual dilaton on the type 2B side. And area of the T2 corresponds to the inverse radius of the circle on the type to B side. Okay. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take our uh, three, for, we're going to take our M theory compactification to three dimensions on Y on a Calabi fourfold, and we're going to assume that in addition it has an elliptic vibration. 
condition, it's fibered by elliptic curves. So roughly speaking, it's of the 4 MB3 times T2. It's not a direct product, it's really a vibration, so it's kind of a funny way to write it, but just so you see the factors. So there's a complex three-dimensional manifold here, and then there's an elliptic curve on top of it, which makes a fourfold, uh, a complex fourfold, and this is our Calabi half fourfold. So we're going to do M theory on three-dimensional Minkowski space times that fourfold. And um, now um, we're going to apply this duality fiber-wise. M theory, so M theory on Y, so it's going to be M theory on R on two times B three times T two, roughly speaking. But M theory on T two is to B on S one, so this is equivalent. If you do this fiber-wise, it's to B times R one two times S one times B three, and then on top of that there is somehow this elliptic curve. But this elliptic curve again from this duality, it's not really the it's not really the elliptic it's not really an elliptic curve. It's part of the space time. It's the elliptic curve which encodes the axial dilaton. Okay, so this comes from applying this duality fiber-wise. Now what we're going to do, um, so we have Minkowski space times a circle, and now we want to decompactify the circle in order to recover four-dimensional Minkowski space. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we take the, uh, the radius of R to infinity, so that means that on the M-theory side, where the radius was identified with one over the area of the torus, okay, uh, that means that you have to take the area of the torus on this side to zero. No, so, yeah, so as I said, so, so the T2 here, I should try to cover it here. So the type to B space time is R12 times S1 times B3. And it's T2, you don't really have it. According to this duality, you don't really have the T2 here. It's just, it, it's, uh, you just uh, identify the, um, you identify the uh, uh, modular parameter with the actual diloton of the type to B. So I, I only left it in here to emphasize that there's a varying actual diloton over the type to B space time. This is not really part of the type to B space time. Okay, so if we compactify this circle and this, uh, uh, by taking the area on the empty side to zero, and we get this type to B on R13 times B3 times T2, and now you can also see where, so n equals 1 supersymmetry reduced in the circle in four dimensions gives you n equals 2 in supersymmetry in three dimensions. That's why I wanted n equals 2 supersymmetry in three dimensions. Okay? So um, from this, taking the circle, opening it up, you also recover n equals 1 supersymmetry in four dimensions. So the upshot of it is that if I take an n theory compactification on an elliptically fibered Calabi-Yau and then uh, take the area of that elliptic fiber and shrink it to zero, then there's another circle that opens up and it's equivalent to a, uh, a type to B compactification on R13 times B3 with extra elliptic curve, which varies over your type to B space time, or equivalently, this is an F theory compactification on um, R13 times Y4, B3 with the elliptic curve. Where again, elliptic curve is the actual dilaton. And, and so this gives a compactification of F theory on a Calabria fourfold to four dimensions and preserves NX1 supersymmetry. So I think this is a good point.